Hi there folks, Michael from First Aid Oils once again. In this video, which is a continuation of our uh, CPR series of videos, uh, we're looking at defibrillation. Now often defibrillation is considered as, as something separate, but the key for this person's survival is the combination of CPR and defibrillation. Uh, statistically, they say that for every minute there's a delay in the heart being shocked or defibrillated, the person's chances of survival decrease by 10%. So it's very important that if you have access to the defibrillator, that you get that defibrillator on the person as quickly as, po as possible. Now I mentioned that it's done in conjunction with CPR. So you may have a situation where you're on your own, Okay, there may be a defibrillator uh, at the front of the building at reception or, or somewhere, you know where it is. If you're the only person uh, who's around, you need to go and get that defibrillator first, okay, and put it on the casualty. All right. The important thing is if there's two people, okay, that you commence CPR immediately and you continue to do CPR whilst the other person goes to get the defibrillator, they come back they apply the defibrillator or you apply the defibrillator. If they're able to apply it while you're still doing CPR, that's fine. Once the defibrillator tells you to stand back, you stand back. Um, or otherwise, uh, you may have to stop and quickly put the defibrillator on. Okay, so remember why we're in this situation. We went through our doctor's A, B, C, D. Uh, we got the response, there was no response, so we said the person is unconscious. Uh, we continued on. At that point, we called for an ambulance, uh, whether we did it ourselves, okay, um, or whether we got someone else to, to call them. These days, with smartphones, mobile phones, um, quite simply, dial triple zero, put it on speaker, put it on the floor next to you, and then you can continue. Uh, back in the day, when you'd have to run to another room to make a phone call uh, with a hardwired phone, you know, things were quite different. But nowadays. Uh, with the convenience of mobile phone, it's much faster and much better. Um, the operator will stay on the phone with you and they'll often talk you through because at this point there'll be a degree of anxiety and perhaps a little bit of panic as well. Okay, so in this case, the person uh, was unconscious. Okay, we've called emergency services, that we've called for paramedics or an ambulance, and we've checked uh, whether there's any obstruction to the airways. If there was, we've tried to clear any obstruction, okay? And then we've got to breathing. Now, in the case of breathing, that's pretty much the trigger point for an unconscious person to determine whether they need CPR or whether we just put them in the recovery position and then start to uh, consider bleeding and things like that. In the case where the person is not breathing or they're only uh, slightly gasping, not, not getting a clear uh, lung full of, of air, if you like, because the critical thing is we need oxygen in our system, in our blood, to go to the brain to keep the brain functioning and also to minimise uh, brain injury. What's happening with this person is they've stopped breathing. Okay, they've stopped breathing, the heart will stop, that blood is not circulating, there's no oxygen coming in and there's no circulation of blood. So the brain is effectively now starting to die. Okay, and the brain has a very limited capacity to survive with no oxygen. Okay, so in this case, what we're looking to do with the combination of CPR and defibrillation is, CPR is the manual process of moving the blood, uh, primarily trying to get oxygen to the brain, slow down the rate of brain injury, and defibrillation is uh, the process of trying to readminister the heart's electrical impulse, which is a signal from the brain, uh, which is an automated uh, process normally, uh, where, which controls the heartbeat, uh, in this case, because there's no communication between the brain and the heart, the heart stops. Okay, so we're trying to reintroduce that electrical impulse to get the heart going again. If the heart starts beating, breathing generally would start as well. Okay, so we've got, as per our CPR series of videos, uh, we mentioned slightly different process for adult, child and infant when it came to CPR, even though the basic guidelines were the same. Defibrillation, it's the same thing. We don't have a separate defibrillator for an adult, a separate defibrillator for a child and infant, okay? Because even though it's an electrical charge, it's not the amount of electrical charge uh, as per sticking your finger in a power socket, which I wouldn't recommend, um, but it's enough charge to hopefully restart the heart. The longer the heart's been stopped, the less likelihood that it would work, but we need to make an attempt. Any attempt is better than none when it comes to uh, CPR and defibrillation. 
So in this case, we have, for example, an adult, okay, and the defibrillator comes with uh, the pads which have diagrams on them where to put them. So one would be uh, the right hand uh, chest and the left hand rib cage, and effectively that sets up an electrical circuit which uh, passes the current through the heart, hopefully to re-trigger the heart to start again. Uh, with an infant or a child, um, particularly with an infant, you wouldn't get both pads on, on the infant's body in those two positions. So a couple of things. One is it comes with a smaller pad uh, for an infant. So all defibrillator packs come in small pads as well. You put the small pads on and you'll go one at the front and one at the back. Otherwise, the machine is the same. Okay. So in that case, when it comes to a child, you have the option, depending on the size of the child, either as per adult, Okay, or you can have the adult size pads and put it front and back as per an infant. But that's uh, really a call that you make. Okay, either of those methods will, will work. All right, so when it comes to the fibrillation, now in this case, uh, we turn the defibrillator on. So let's assume whether we commence with CPR uh, and the person brought the defibrillator, we put it on, or whether we've run to get it, we've put it on. We have to turn the defibrillator on, okay, and it'll talk to us. First thing in the room, it's checking for a heart rhythm. It's checking for any electrical Do impulse in the heart. The patient. It's important that you're not touching the person so that it doesn't read your electrical impulse. Shock advised. Okay, so it's obviously not found a reading. It's advising a shock. Charging. Okay, the critical thing is here that Stay you're not clear of the patient. You're not in contact with the person. Okay. Deliver so shock you move now. Back and you press manually the orange button now. Manually press the button yourself. Shock delivered. So it, it checks again for a moment. Start CPR. Okay, so now you commence the CPR. So we go with our 30 compressions. Okay, and you'll hear the beeping on the defibrillator. That's pretty much giving us the rhythm, okay? Now again, you have the option to start with two breaths or start with 30 compressions. Entirely up to you. Uh, as we mentioned in the previous video, depends on the time lapse between whether the person has just collapsed or whether the person has been uh, not breathing for a period of time, in which case you might start with the breathing. Plus also in, in this age of COVID, you may be reluctant to breathe uh, into the person you don't have the barrier, so whether it's a face shield or, or a mask, in which case just do the compressions. That will be more helpful than doing nothing. And there is still some, uh, a little bit of air or oxygen that will go in through the nose and mouth in that situation. Anyway, this will continue. So we do our uh, cycles of CPR and this will go on for a period of time and then the fibrillator will kick in once again and it'll recheck to see if there's been any start. Uh, if it does detect uh, there is perhaps a rhythm in the heart uh, the second time round or the third time round or the fourth time round, um, it'll tell you continue CPR if required. So what it means by if required is that it's found uh, some activity uh, but if breathing hasn't returned you need to continue CPR because heart uh, electrical impulse and no breathing, it's kind of redundant. So we need the breathing to return as well. If the breathing is also returned, then we put the person in the recovery position, okay, on their side, okay, obviously this is only a mannequin. Um, with a person, of course, I would have gloves, uh, but this is not a person. Um, and we leave the, the pads on, don't take the pads off, okay? Um, and then we would proceed as per the non-breathing conscious person, which our next priority then is uh, bleeding, particularly dangerous bleeding and so forth. But we'll talk more about bleeding in our bleeding video. So that's the process for defibrillation. Very, very important and very key component of this person's chance of survival. Because effectively when we're doing CPR, even in the past, in the days without defibrillators being widely available, it was CPR until the ambulance got there, okay? What was the difference when the ambulance got there? they would come with their defibrillator to try and restart the heart. So now with defibrillators readily available, uh, if you don't want, have one in your workplace, I recommend you consider getting one. Uh, particularly if you're in a environment where the person is at a higher risk of you know, perhaps a cardiac arrest. Um, and a little bit of difference between cardiac arrest and heart attack. A heart attack, obviously there, there are some signs and symptoms and you get a little bit of a warning and it's obviously uh, lifestyle factors in that, that that play a part as well, uh, but cardiac arrest is, is uh, effectively what it says, ca sudden cardiac arrest, and it really can happen anywhere. So it doesn't uh, only happen in the gym, or it doesn't only happen in a certain environment, it can happen anywhere. So 
if you're able to have the defibrillator in your workplace, seriously consider it. Perhaps even in, in your home, particularly if you've got a swimming pool or particularly if you've got a, a toddler, okay, because uh, we mentioned in, in the baby CPR video, uh, child uh, drownings or toddler drownings in the bath are reasonably common. Uh, so you may also consider for the sake of around a, a couple of thousand dollars, if it's for your work, that's tax deductible. So really uh, seriously uh, worth considering in, in the big scheme of things, it's not a high price to pay if you ever had to use it and it worked okay anyway that's uh, all for our defibrillation video uh, so remember keep this in in perspective with a combination of CPR to give the person the best chance of uh, recovering from from this uh, fairly dire situation if nothing is done in this situation the person has no chance to recover okay thank you